I'm going to be talking about why leverage or debt is so important in growing your passive income, as counterintuitive as it sounds, the difference between good debt and bad debt, and how you need to rewire how you think about leverage. This is probably one of the most important shows or episodes that I'm going to record, so I'm sure you're gonna get tons of value from it. Do you want to achieve wealth and passive income through property investing? P.K. Gupta, host of Oz Property Investment Mastery, will help you achieve passive income by buying top 5% growth and positive cash flow property and building a portfolio using data without you wasting months of time doing research, spending weekends at inspections, or dropping ten dollars to $20,000 on buyer's agents each time. So if you are confused and overwhelmed by the amount of contradictory information available online and don't know where to start, then this show is for you. Let's get into it. All right, so here's the analogy. I want you to connect with this. Stay with me here. You know when you're in the school playground, you're in the playground, you're in the um, the yard, you know, it's recess, it's lunchtime, it's afternoon tea, whatever the case may be. You're in high school, primary school, whatever. And you're kind of there and you see two two types of people. One, and you know, I'm, I'm just kind of throwing out all political correctness here, um, so bear with me. One is the kind of the nerdy type, and you're like, oh, I don't know if I really want to go over there. I don't know if I, I really want to be associated with those people. What if, how does it impact my reputation? Okay, I, I don't I want to be with the cool guys. And then on the other side of the play yard, you see these people that are a little bit more rough, a little bit, you know, not so sophisticated, they're maybe doing some inappropriate things, and these are the people, the kids that your uh, your parents, you know, warned you not to associate with lest you start taking drugs and all those things, all right? So good debt and bad debt are like those. Good debt is like the, the group of nerds. Once again, I was probably a nerd as well. I, I don't want to stereotype here, but um, good debt is like the, the the nerds that you don't really want to hang around, but they go on to be Bill Gates, but they go on to be Elon Musk, but they go on to be, you know, Jeff Bezos, whatever the case is. And then five years down, 10 years down, 30, 30 years down in your life, you're like, Oh, damn, I, I kind of wish that I was friends with them. I kind of wish that I associated with them. That could have helped me, you know. And then the drug dealers or, you know, the, the kind of rough kids are like bad debt, you know, the credit card debt, all that kind of thing. And you're like, yeah, you know what? Um, I don't really want to deal with them. And, and there's a good reason why my, my parents said to avoid them. Okay, the problem that we make, guys, the problem that we make is that we lump both the rough kids and the nerds into the same category and we say both are bad. Okay, we say both are bad. We say debt, regardless of its form, regardless of its shape, regardless of its use, is bad. Whereas in actuality, if we associated with those, you know, studious academic types, we would have got so much, so much more ahead in life, you know, if we had actually made that connection. Okay, so this is the thing. Bad debt is like credit card debt. It's debt that gives you stress. It gives you that inability to sleep at night. You know, we all have that threshold. We all have different risk appetites. Bad debt is where you're piling on debt to fuel your consumption habits, to fuel your consumerism, and you're not able to pay it off, right? You're, instead of growing your wealth, you're growing your your, your vanity, you're growing your sense gratification, all these things that aren't really going to be there for you in the long term. Short-term habits, short-term gain for long-term pain. All right, that's bad debt. Those are the kids that are dealing drugs. But don't mistake them for being like the studious types, the academic types, the scholarly types, the introspective types the types that are curious and will actually want to grow themselves. Okay, don't make that mistake. Good debt, what you actually need in property investing is deductible. 
okay? That means that every dollar of debt that you get, the repayments, the interest repayments on that are tax deductible unlike bad debt. So you actually get a windfall back. The second feature or ingredient of good debt is that it actually increases your return on investment. Okay, so get this, I often often use this example when I'm talking to my sharehold um, stock trading buddies or share trading buddies. You know, they're always like, oh, PK, you know, why do you do so much um, property investing? You're like 95% exposed in real estate, 5% other asset classes. I always give this example. Let's say you have $50,000, okay? And you can either invest it in the stock market or you can invest it in the property market. If you take that $50,000, invest it in the stock market, Let's say you have a great year, you make 20%, like a lot of you must have in the last 12 months. 20% of $50,000 is $10,000. Okay, that's good. Yeah, nothing wrong with that. Instead, what if you took that $50,000, leveraged up, let's say 70, 80, 90%. I just did a video in my last video on LMI, go check it out. It weaves into this really easily. If you took a a loan of 80, 89, um, 90%, Right, yeah, that three, that five, fifty thousand dollar deposit can become a four hundred thousand dollar property, and if that grows by ten percent, that's forty thousand dollars. Okay, so forty thousand dollars of growth on a fifty thousand dollar deposit is basically a hundred percent, like almost a hundred percent. And then I'll add on tap on that if you have positive cash flow, then you're looking at fifty thousand dollars of benefit, forty plus ten. You know, that's 100% return on investment, okay? So just compare the both. Now, this video is not meant to be stock trading versus property investing. There's many nuances I can go on into there, but it's to illustrate that with good debt, we can increase our return on investment, all right? The third ingredient of good debt is that it actually compounds wealth, okay? So let's say you start with $50,000. The first person that invested into the stock market, you know, they made $10,000 and let's say they're very diligent and they take that 10,000, put it back into their portfolio, they reinvest those dividends or reinvest and now they've got a portfolio of $60,000. Okay, 60,000. And once again, like let's say they get 10% return on invest and that's 66,000 after 2 years and then 10% on 66, uh, you know, it just keeps going up. But what if you invested in property leveraged the principle of good debt. You bought that $400,000 property with $50,000 deposit. It went up um, to $440,000 or $450,000 in year one. And after two years, it's gone up to $500,000. And then you go to the bank and say, can I take $80,000 of that increase or $100,000 of that increase or $50,000 of that increase, whatever it is, whatever your risk threshold is, you take that as equity, all right? That equity is just debt. It's good debt. (laughs) Um, You take that as equity, and then you buy another house with it, okay? Another house. Once again, positive cash flow house. Another positive cash flow property. And then after two years, that one goes up by $100,000 or um, even, let's say, $80,000, which is pretty conservative. And then you take that equity out again and then you buy a third one and meanwhile the first one's gone up again so you can take more out of that so you can see how you can compound your wealth you can build a portfolio you can build assets just by starting off by fifty thousand dollars does that make sense you know it's because in property investing when you realize the growth you don't have to sell it to fully realize it you can draw the equity that draw the increase and use it to fund another deposit again and again and again. So good debt allows someone like me who started off with, let's say, fifty, hundred, hundred and fifty thousand dollars of hard-earned money, you know, from my PAYG to grow a portfolio of nine to four, uh, nine to thirteen um, residential and commercial properties in just over ten years allows me to do that. If I had otherwise used that hundred thousand dollars or hundred and fifty thousand dollars of hard-earned money to invest in the stock market, sure. After 10, 11, 12 years, I might have been on half a million dollars. That's still a good outcome. But it's not as good of an outcome as nine residential properties, four commercial assets, you know, giving 100K plus passive income, 120K passive income. I wouldn't have been able to do that if I had not 
leverage the principle of leverage of good debt. Okay, and the the fourth ingredient that you know is good about good debt is that in an inflationary environment, in an environment where the price of goods and services is, incre is increasing, if you're not getting into an asset, if you're not investing your money, your money is going backwards in the bank account. A more advanced way to understand that is if you get debt, that debt is actually shrinking because the value of money is going backwards. Okay, let me repeat that. If you have $100,000 in the bank account, the interest payments that the bank is giving you, you know, is let's say 1% and the inflation rate is 3%, then every year your money, that $100,000 is losing 2% of its value, just very roughly. Now on the flip side, to take this theme on, if you've got $100,000 of debt, $100,000 of debt, that is also losing its value, right? Money is money, whether it's an asset or it's a debt. So in an inflationary environment, that debt is also eroding its value. In other words, in a year from now or in four years from now or in 10 years from now, that $100,000 isn't worth $100,000. It's actually worth, let's say, seventy dollars or $80,000. It's actually easier to pay back, right? Does that make sense? It's just a concept. It's theoretical. Connect with it. That's the fourth ingredient of good debt. Now, I know what you're saying. You're, you're probably thinking, Look, PK, all this is fine. You know, this is, this is all good, but I just can't. I just can't think about the fact that I would need millions of dollars of debt to build a, a six-figure passive income or to build um, financial freedom for myself. I can't stomach uh, a seven-figure debt portfolio. Here's the thing. Debt is only good if you can manage its cash flows. All right, so no one, including me, is saying that you should get into one, two, three, four million dollars of debt if you can't afford to pay, if you can't afford to pay the interest repayments, right? Right? That is not, no one is saying that. And that is why you need to buy positively geared property, right? Like even if myself, like let's say this business went, went bust and for some reason no employer would never hire me again, I would still be able to service my debt because the properties are all positive cash flow. They're all paying for themselves and more. Okay, so good debt, you can recognize good debt by the symptom that the asset that the debt is used to buy pays for the debt itself, okay? The asset that the debt is used to buy helps fund pay the debt off in of itself without any, you know, external income or incumbency required, okay? And the second thing, the pushback, the devil's advocate that you're probably playing, you're probably thinking, you're probably... Um, you know, marinating in your mind is that, well, this is cool. Um, you know, this all makes sense. It kind of is logical. That's, that's great. But at some point, I got to pay this debt back. Like, how am I going to do that? You know, like, even if I have a positively geared property giving me five or $10,000 of positive cash flow per annum, like, that's not going to be enough for me to pay back millions of dollars of debt. And this is where strategy comes into the fold. Strategy. Now, this is not a secret source or some mysterious esoteric science. Thousands or tenth of thousands of property investors in Australia have done this before, where you use the assets themselves to pay off the debt. So let's say, very rough example, let's say you buy um, six investment properties. Now, you don't need six investment properties, I'm just making this up. And let's say each of those properties at the time of purchase was $500,000. I'm just using a round number. You don't need to spend half a million dollars, but $500,000. Now, six investment properties, let's say, bought over the course of, you know, four, five, six years, whatever, at $500,000 each is a portfolio of $3 million, okay? Um, $3 million on which the majority will be debt right? I've just explained, you would get debt to build a portfolio. So you're probably thinking, well, how am I going to pay all this millions of dollars of debt off? What happens is that, let's say after 10 years, after 12 years, easier said than done, the execution is important, the devil is in the detail. But the principle is, after 10 years, 12 years, 13 years, whatever, those six properties go from 500 to $1 million each, okay? If you look at the statistics, what happens in Australia, um, but you know you have to you have to do it correctly. You can make a big mistake as well. 
So that $500,000 property has become a million dollars times six. So that's three million, um, three million dollar portfolios become six million dollars. And then what you can do is you can sell two properties, you can sell three properties, you can maybe just sell one property and use the cash profit to pay off the properties that you didn't sell. So imagine now you've got a $6 million portfolio, six properties worth $1 million each. You sell three of them and you pocket $3 million, all right? Three properties worth $3 million each. You sell them, you pocket $3 million. Of course, I know there's transaction costs, capital gains tax, you know, let's just even say you pocket $2 million. It's more than that, but just be conservative. And then what you can do is you can take that $2 million, use it to pay off the three properties that you didn't sell. You pay off the three properties that you didn't sell. And now you have three properties, right, worth $3 million, basically debt-free. And that is how you really ramp up your passive income. That is the hockey stick. Throughout this journey, you know, you've been building your passive income, 5,000 here, 10,000 there. But then the hockey stick really exponentially increases when you pay off debt, when you get rid of that incumbency by selling one, two, three assets. That is the name of the game. That is how property portfolios are built slowly, gradually, but securely. Okay, and throughout that journey of 10, 15, 20 years, you have been building passive income, you've been able to manage your cash flows, but the point or principle of leverage good debt has allowed you to build assets, has allowed you to grow your asset portfolio to such an extent that there's so much equity that you can then sell some of your assets to pay off the others, and then you're laughing. You've got three investment properties, you know, maybe paying $30,000, $40,000 each, positive cash flow because there's no debt, there's no interest repayments, there's no loan repayments, that's the biggest thing, right? And if you can do this right, if you can do it well, if you have enough borrowing capacity, then you can go interest only throughout the journey, right? So you've not actually had to put in a single cent of your hard-earned money, not a single cent of your hard-earned money. That's what I've done. I've never gone principal and interest. Of course, everyone is different, but I've, you can go 10, 15, 20-year journey, build your property portfolio, never have to sacrifice your lifestyle, and leave with no debt, three assets, you know, giving you six-figure passive income, without it affecting your lifestyle, without it being difficult, without you know have sleepless nights. <clears throat> this is all possible using the principle of good debt. Okay, guys, so don't make the mistake of looking out in the playground and thinking, oh, look, those guys have got a bit of acne on their faces. They look, they're in the books. They've got big spectacles on. You know, those are the nerds. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to ignore them. No, don't do that. That is like ignoring good debt. You don't know who they will become. You don't know how you can evolve. You can transform what you can become in their association. Okay, those are the next Bill Gates. Those are the next Elon Musk. Those are the next Je Jeff Bezos. Those are the next, probably not Richard Branson. I think he was a cool sort of guy the whole time, but I don't know. You know, don't think that those group of kids are the same as the drug dealer kids next to the fence. You know, like, I don't, let's not go into it. Do you know what I mean? Hopefully this episode has been super useful, guys. I really want to emphasize that the real estate between your two ears, these six inches, that is the most important real estate that you own. Don't outsource the accountability. Don't outsource the responsibility of your financial future. Knowledge is power. Learn, learn, learn and then execute and demolish the execution. Catch you later, guys. My name's PK. Yeah.